Okay, the question is, now that we know that entropy and enthalpy can both influence whether a reaction takes place, how do we know which one dominates? We need to introduce a new energy, one that includes contributions from both entropy and enthalpy, and that is called Gibbs free energy, okay? Gibbs free energy is defined as the maximum amount of non-expansion work that can be extracted from a closed system. So that's the thermodynamic definition of it. For us, just think of it as an energy. Whenever, for the rest of this class, when we talk about, oh, this happened because it lowered its energy, it started here and ended there, therefore it was favorable, we're talking about Gibbs free energy in this class, okay? So the change in the Gibbs free, at react, uh, Gibbs free energy for a reaction is gonna tell us whether that reaction happens, right? As we go from reactants to products, if the change of Gibbs free energy for that reaction is equal to zero, then we know that that reaction must be at equilibrium, right? That's one scenario. But if it is greater than zero, right? If, it, if the change in energy is positive, it goes up in energy as the reaction takes place, then we know that this is not favorable. Not favorable. But if it's less than zero, then it is favorable. Okay, those are our three scenarios. So we can calculate delta G from enthalpy and entropy. We just said that it takes into account both of them. So delta, the Gibbs free energy is equal, the change in Gibbs free energy is equal to the change in enthalpy multiply, or minus temperature multiplied by the change in entropy of that reaction, okay? So that's how we calculate Gibbs free energy. It takes into account both H and S. Okay? And we talked about our three scenarios. If it's equal to zero, then the reactants and products are in equilibrium. If it's less than zero, that is not a favorable reaction. Uh, sorry, if it's less than zero, it is a favorable reaction. And if it's greater than zero, that is not a favorable reaction. Okay? Now, just because a reaction is favorable, that the delta G is less than zero, by starting from your products and going to your reactants, it goes down in energy, it doesn't mean that that's going to happen in real life. Because it also depends on the kinetics, the rate at which that reaction happens, and they might be really slow. For example, you might not believe it, but diamond is actually in a higher energy state than graphite. Therefore, all your diamond rings should be converting to graphite, right? They should be converting to graphite. Um, that is thermodynamically favorable reaction is for graphite to uh, be produced from diamond. However, that doesn't happen, at least not at room temperature, because the kinetics are way too slow. Okay, so we will talk more about kinetics in chapter 11. Um, and it's important that we learn about these things because, for example, the phase diagrams that we're going to cover in chapter 10, those are all based off of the assumption that we are at delta G equals zero, right? That the reactants are in equilibrium with the products, okay? So we'll talk about what that means a little later. But essentially, it means these are happening under you let it sit for a very long time and reach equilibrium, okay? So consider the following uh scenarios. What happens if delta H is less than zero? Remember, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, okay? So if delta H is less than zero, okay, that means that this is a negative term right there, and delta S is a positive term because it's greater than zero, so entropy, entropy increases, so we're doing a negative term plus temperature multiplied by a positive number. Will this be favorable or not? Well, it could be negative or positive depending on the temperature, right? If it's at a high temperature, right, delta G, so if the temperature is high, then delta G is probably going to be what? Also positive, it's gonna be greater than zero because this term's gonna take over. If T is low, then it will be negative because this term will take over, right? And so you can imagine different scenarios where even though delta H and delta S have different values, the delta G could be one or the other depending on the role of temperature, which is kind of interesting, okay? Now, delta G, the change in the Gibbs free energy, the reaction that we use for it is actually not usually this equation very often. This will work, um, but that uh, is under a specific set of conditions where we're at one uh, member before we said that the, the that the little zero that means that it's happening for one mole of substance under standard conditions so one bar of atmosphere and equal molar concentrations so in the real world we need to consider the delta g that accounts for that the delta g naught term that's the one for unit activity at a certain temperature 
But then we need to modify this for when things don't have unit activity. What on earth is activity again? So activity is written as A. And the way that you can think of activity is as an effective concentration. Effective concentration. Now, why do we need an effective concentration? Why can't you just use the actual concentration? Well, because materials don't behave like normal um, all the time. Concentrations um, have effective concentrations in the limits of very high and very low concentrations. So you learned about these as Henry and Raoult's law in chemistry in Gen Chem. So you can't just use the outright concentration. Instead, you have to use the activity. And so this new expression that we have for delta G, it accounts for things under normal conditions, standard state conditions, that's this red term, delta G naught. Remember the zero means standard state conditions. And then you have this blue term, RT natural log Q. And now Q is our reaction quotient, okay? So what is the reaction quotient, okay? Let's consider a reaction of some generic gases, right? A moles of A gas, B moles of B gas are reacting to form C moles of C and D moles of D. Well, what would be the reaction quotient for that reaction? When you do this, you do it by writing down the activities of the products over the reactants. And when you're at equilibrium, you call Q K, right? So Q equals K, Q equals K when delta G, the change in the Gibbs free energy is equal to zero, or in other words, equilibrium equilibrium. That's why sometimes you'll hear K referred to as the equilibrium constant. Okay. Now, how do you calculate Q? It's the activities of the products over the reactants. So for this reaction over here, it's going to be products over reactants, the products over reactants. And since these are gases, instead of using the activities, we're going to use the partial pressure. Okay. Since it's products over reactants, we start with the products. So it's going to be the partial pressure of gas C raised to the small c, how many moles there are of that gas, multiplied by the partial pressure of gas D, raised to the exponent of how many moles there are of gas D. This is going to be divided by the partial pressure of gas A, raised to the number of moles of gas A, multiplied by the partial pressure of gas B, raised to the number of moles there are of B. Let me fix that. Okay? So that is the reaction quotient. Okay? Now, how do you figure out partial pressure? By Dalton's law of partial pressure, the total pressure, P sub T, is the sum of the partial pressure. So P sub T is going to equal to the partial pressure contribution from gas A, B, C, and D. So each one of these gases is contributing to the overall pressure of some sort of vessel. So if the total pressure were 1, then the reaction would be occurring at 1 bar total pressure. Okay. Now, in this class, you can assume that the activity of all solids and liquids is one, unless you're told otherwise. So when we're doing a reaction like this, when you're writing the reaction quotient, you write the activities of the products or the reactants. So if your reactant involved at a solid here, then it would just be one. And run one raised to any exponent is just one. So essentially what you're doing is you're just leaving out solids and liquids from this Q term, okay? And that's an assumption. It's not one that's always justified, but for this class, since it's an introduction, that's the assumption we're gonna make. Okay. And just like before, when we wanted to calculate delta H and delta S for different reactions, if you knew the standard molar, uh, the, let's see, if you knew the standard molar entropy or the formation enthalpies, then you can do the exact same thing for delta G. Delta G is taken by the products minus reactants, making sure to multiply the delta G naught values, that's the formation energy values, by the number of moles in the reaction. We're going to do a few examples in the following video.